Good morning or good afternoon and welcome back to Submarine Live. We're broadcasting from Sonodyne HQ and this week on Submarine Live we are talking to you all about submarine exploration. We've been connecting with the Nexon First Descent mission and they are exploring the uncharted depths of the oceans around the Seychelles archipelago using submersible technology to find out more about these deeper parts of the ocean down to 250 meters. Now today's session is a live investigation part of AXA XL Oceans Education and we'll be looking at ROV technology, that's remotely operated vehicles. And some of the difficulties uh, that you might have in exploring the deep. But before we start, I just want to give you an overview of Necton First Ascent and give you a sense of the scale of this expedition. So I think we've got some great footage looking up and over um, the surface vessel. So the surface vessel is what is necessary for deploying the submersibles down to the deep. This is the ocean sephir out in the Indian Ocean. And from there, these two smaller submersibles, so the difference between a submarine and a submersible is that a submersible needs these larger support vessels or mother ships on the surface. Those submersibles are then descending down into the ocean. Now in this part of the Indian Ocean, scientists have only ever really been down to 30 meters. Now that's the limit of scuba diving. Using this technology means that scientists can go down to 250 meters, an incredible extension of our knowledge of this part of the world. Really, really exciting and they're using a number of different tools to explore when they are down there. Now, I don't know whether we can see an image of the uh, submersible on a wall, uh, but you can see that it's looking at this part of the deep ocean and sampling, so taking samples from here. If you're going deeper still, and the expedition is also using an ROV, essentially a robotic uh, submarine, you can go down deeper, I think, to 500 meters using the ROV they have on Necton First Descent. And again, you might have some different tools that you're looking at um, using to explore the deep. So you might have a camera to film some of the creatures that are down there. You might have a robotic arm to take samples. You might have other tools to take uh, water samples, for instance, and to see what the water chemistry is at different depths. Now today we are going to look at what it means to be an ROV scientist and if we're back in the studio from having seen that amazing underwater footage um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the setup that we need. So one of the things we're looking at is the kind of tools you need to do the job. So as a setup what I hope you have in your class is you've got some practice objects. I'll move this here. That's going to get all your questions coming in. Uh, actually, that's a good point. Let's just see who we have online this morning. Uh, we have schools from the UK and the Ukraine. We have Oakthorpe Primary School. Amazing to have you. Wonderful to have you uh, at Oakthorpe. Uh, we have St. Winifred's, uh, St. Paul's Church of England Junior School and Novo Yevgorivka School in Ukraine. Fantastic uh, to have you all with us. And already I can see some great questions coming through. And there's a very interesting question before we dive into our live investigation. What is the purpose of ROVs? Uh, why can't you just use submersibles? I think, Jim, we might be able to get a, a shot of um, the small ROV I have on the table in front of me here. Now, it is easier 
to go deeper with an ROV because you don't have to worry about your scientists um, in the submersible. So it's really about accessibility and tools and keeping people safe at different depths. What you probably saw from that sort of bubble, that sort of acrylic bubble that is encasing the submersible pilot and scientist is it gives us them an amazing 360 view of the deep ocean. So they are used in tandem, so you can be on, on an expedition where you are searching some areas with a greater view using a submersible, and then you can go deeper still where you might just be using a grabber and a camera. So the feed for an ROV is a, is a line feed, so you've got this video camera often and then this line and power line coming back up to the surface so that you can see a um, see the image of what the ROV is seeing. So just uh, coming back to this um, little live investigation, what we're looking at is how do you accurately find out what is on the floor of the ocean? How do you sample things? Now, I've got a range of tools. These are different things that you're going to need. So first of all, um, we're going to need some tools. These are our sampling tools. And I'll just hold these up in a moment. So I have a ladle, of course. So here we have here. I have a wooden spoon. I have some kitchen tongs. Uh, for some reason, the team have given me uh, a clothes peg, so we'll see how useful that is. Uh, chopsticks. So, chopsticks here. Uh, a tea strainer, of course. And we would always have to have a spoon. So on a ROV or submersible, you might have these different tools on board. And what we're going to look at is what happens if we select one of these tools and try and take a sample of everything um, that we find on the seabed and whether using certain tools alters what we can bring back to the surface. So maybe we have a, a different understanding of what's in the deep sea, depending on the tools that we use. So I have my deep sea area here. There is a level of anxiety I have because the team have put a variety of secret items underneath these cloths here. So I've got some practice items, which I'm going to attempt to take from the deep sea into my sampling box. So if you're doing this with us at school, you need to have a selection of implements. You need to have some practice items, which I'll show you in just a minute. And then you need to have your secret subsea um, selection of things to collect. And our aim as good scientists is to select the right tools for the job. I think I only get one choice. Do I get one choice, Jem, or, or I'm allowed two tools for this first one? I'm allowed two. You're, you're, you're very kind. So I've got two tools on my ROV um, to try and work this out. So my aim as a good scientist is to take these samples, get them in the collection box, and then I can take them back to the surface for further analysis and research. OK. So what do I have? I have a leak here. Um, I have an incredibly heavy section of subsea pipe, which can, can sort of withstand pressures thousands of meters down in the ocean. And I have a mug. Ah, no, I have. Uh, rice, little grains of rice. So a really nice, uh, easy <laughs> to pick up 
um, selection of objects there. So if I'm trying to do a very heavy piece of pipe, a uh, jar of uh, mug of rice, and uh, some leeks. I think I'm going to go for, maybe I use the chopsticks and chopsticks and I think a wooden spoon. Chopsticks and a wooden spoon. So this is my practice goes. So if you've got your practice items, do select your uh, tools to start off with and do have a practice. So how long do you reckon I should have to get these three objects safely from the sea floor into my sampling box? A minute? A minute. I'm gonna you, give, give me a minute. Jim, can you can you count me down a minute? G give me a give me and uh, give me an on your marks, get set, go. Three, two, go. Right. Uh, right, first things first, I'm gonna try and get a grain of rice. A grain of um, a grain of rice. A grain of, here we go, grain of rice, and I've got to put it very gently in here, I can't drop it. Grain of rice going in the corner there. Four grains of rice, excellent. Uh, uh, that's just not going to work, using chopsticks. Can I use chopsticks uh, on a leak and not drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. Yes. Um, that's just not going to work. What other? What was the other one I had? It was, it was wooden spoon. Wooden spoon. Um, can I? Can I? Aha! Uh -huh. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Uh. How, how long? Brilliant. Oh, I nearly knocked my <laughs> sampling box over there. Uh, so there we go. If you. You are doing your practice round, trying to move your practice samples from the seafloor into your sampling box. I reckon if you get sort of like two out of three, three out of four, four out of six, then I reckon we can go, go to the next level. So interested to know how you're getting on. Let's see um, if we've got anyone who is managing to work through those coming up online. Um, and then I'm going to put these back down on the floor. Get my practice items out of the way. Let's see here. I'll leave the rice in there. I think the rice is OK in there. OK, put this down here. So as an ROV pilot, uh, what you're doing is you are operating what the ROV does at depth. So you've, it's a bit like playing a computer game. You've got um, a joystick um, and you are controlling how the ROV moves. And let's grab this little one that I have here. We'll move the sampling box for now, just while we talk through this. Move that all to one side. Here we go. So the ROV is attached by a wire that goes back up to the surface. You'll have a little joystick that is controlling the thrusters. Now on this one, we've got thrusters at the rear, allowing it to go backwards and forwards. And we've got thrusters here at the top so it can go up and down. On a bigger ROV, you might have a hydraulic arm, and then you can also see where it's going. Most will have a pretty well all will have a camera um, at the front, so you can see where the ROV um, is going. So, bring that back over here towards the front. Uh, so, your job as an ROV pilot is really to be a really skillful, sort of like remote control submarine driver, and then to spot. Um, what's needed over here, and to try and get the samples that the scientists are after. But back to having our real go of being an ROV scientist. Let's see, come back up here. 
So, uh, I've got to try and select the right tools for this because although I practice on a bit of piping and some rice and a leak, uh, I don't know what I'm going to find down in this real sample place in the ocean. Do I go with the same tools that, that really worked for me on the first time round, or do I select something different? I'm going to trust in the same, the same tools to get me through whatever is under uh, these cloths. So I'm going to put away the ladle, spoon, the clothes peg, whoever put that one in there, the tea strainer, the tongs, I'm a little bit sad to see go, because I think those could have been quite useful, but the chopsticks did, the good, did a good job. And now for the big reveal. So what have we got in here? Take this one off. Oh my giddy aunt. Ah. Well, thank you so much, team, for selecting this really, really easy range of objects to move. So if you can see on the camera, I have uh, a box of raw eggs, a, a loaf of bread, a pear, carrot, and the ever easy to lift sheet of uncooked lasagna. Oof. Well, this could go badly wrong pretty quickly. Um, how, how long have I got for the real thing, do you reckon? Uh, two, two I've got two minutes for the real thing. And do you think I have chosen poorly with my chopsticks and my wooden spoon for this one? Uh, the, eggs might be fun. the eggs are going to be fun. We are in the HQ of a marine engineering um, company. I am... I don't know... Can I, can I try lifting a raw egg with chopsticks in somebody else's? What do we reckon? What do we reckon? I want some. I want some response on the live chat, please. Do I lift a raw egg using chopsticks? Um, uh, there is a question there about what is the most stressful, challenging part of your role. I can say now it is, it is using chopsticks on a raw egg. Have, when does my time start? Right, I'm going to go for the easy stuff first. I'm going to see if I can do a carrot with some chopsticks. I've got two minutes. No, no. Okay. If I drop it, if it goes anywhere, okay. Ah! So that doesn't really count because although one in my sampling box is probably a bit smushed. Okay. Maybe I'm going to try to do something easier. Maybe I can go for a sheet a sheet of lasagna a sheet of lasagna sheet of lasagna sheet of lasagna okay okay Whew. that is uh, one out of five how do you do how do you do a how do you do a loaf of bread with a wooden spoon don't drop it on the eggs just don't drop it on the eggs then drop it on the eggs. This is kind of halfway. Okay. This is not what I thought I'd be doing today. Who chose these objects? I can't. So I'm just going to feel this is going to drop. Control drop. Do I get that one? Yeah. Great. Um, going to do the pair. Pair with chopsticks. Pair with chopsticks. Aha! Who knew that a pair with chopsticks would be relatively easy? He says before. There we go. <coughs> okay, this is gonna this is gonna this make it easy. And so I am trying. A 
Okay, so I did try. Um, I'm quite glad in some ways that it is incredibly difficult to pick up a raw egg uh, with chopsticks. So if this were a real um, submersible expedition, we're exploring the deep sea, and I only had the sampling equivalent of a wooden spoon and chopsticks. If there were a creature the shape or size of a raw egg on the bottom of the sea, I wouldn't be able to bring that back to the surface. I wouldn't really know what it is. And it's really interesting to speaking in speaking to one of the science team on board uh, the Necton First Ascent uh, mission, who was saying that it's really easy for them to collect physical samples of sponges or corals or some algae um, that live on the seafloor and, and don't swim away. Um, and if you're a sort of jelly-like creature, um, really, really hard to take a sample of you because it's pretty smushy. Uh, and if you're a fish, then, then you're swimming away. So what the Nectin team are doing is they have two main ways of sampling. You've got physical sampling where you're using uh, something like those kitchen tongs where you're using a, a sampling method to, to take physical samples. And then a lot of the work is done using a high definition camera. And we heard Denise this morning talking about how she uses that high definition camera to rebuild 3D maps of the bottom of the sea. But that in combination, that grabber and that video camera give you a pretty good idea of what's down there. Um, and so if you are, do have raw eggs down there, if you can't grab them, maybe you can take a really good video of them and study that instead. So how, I'm wondering how you guys got on um, with being ROV scientists. Um, we're just going to see um, some of the questions that are coming through on the live chat. Um, Great question coming through. What is the most uh, stressful or challenging part of your role? So I work as an expedition educator, sharing uh, the, the experiences of the scientists and others who are on, on the team. It's been from being on a submersible expedition with the Necton team a, a few years ago in the Bermuda, to being in the Arctic, to being on coral reefs. And I think the most challenging thing is it's never easy. We've got stuff beaming in from the ships, from the submersibles, or surviving at minus 40. And it's, it's overcoming those environmental challenges, that challenge of working in these difficult places, and, and especially with technology that doesn't want to work, and making sure all that links up and gets that picture and that image back to you guys in the classroom. So that's the most challenging bit. You probably... Uh, don't see all the stuff that happens behind the scenes uh, to make these broadcasts possible. Um, but it, it, it is not as simple as flipping on a camera and, and speaking down it. So amazing team uh, making this all work. Wow, do you need a background in robotics or coding uh, to work with ROVs? Certainly um, a background in um, robotics and engineering really, really helps. So a lot of the team into electrical engineering, electrics and water really don't like working together. If you are on an expedition where you're offshore, like on the ocean surfer, the, the, the ship that is being used for Necton First Ascent, you cannot just take your ROV or submersible to a shop to get repaired you have to have all those skills involved. In terms of the coding, there is more and more coding being involved in marine science and other sciences at the moment. So if you think about some of the artificial intelligence that can be used in marine um, science, we've got everything um, from um, compiling different databases to species recognition. Now, if I go over the seafloor and take hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage, ideally what I'd like is for a machine to be able to go through all that footage and automatically sort of annotate the different species that are there, where they are, plot those on a digital map, 
um, and record their abundance as well. And so that is very much a part of machine learning, recognizing uh, different species from, from, a, um, from, a, from a video feed. And one of the interesting <laughs> problems that you have, imagine you, you're getting a, a video feed from an ROV like this, and you have a fish that swims past you, and it comes around behind you, and it swims past you again. How do you get a, or code a machine to recognize that's the same fish twice rather than two fish? So how accurate can you, you get this, where you get a sense of the pattern of swimming, the direction it's coming from, some individual markings or size or, or whatever? So it's, it's really, really interesting challenges everywhere from the physical computing, the robotics of getting the machine into the water, working and doing its job, to the analysis using coding techniques, getting into artificial intelligence, a fascinating area of future research. Do I know when the first ROV was used? I'm afraid not, and that's probably something um, that we can find out online. Um, certainly the sort of first bathosphere, so the first time that hu humans went, went deep in the ocean was in the 1930s um, off the coast of Bermuda. Um, but in terms of ROVs and robotic submersibles, I don't know. One of the things that I find fascinating about ROVs is they've gone from being something quite specialised um, to something um, which is quite open, um, so that now there is a a team um, that creates something called Open ROV, and that means that you can buy a kit ROV um, from uh, 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 an organization and build, build it yourself and start exploring the ocean on your own terms. So they really opened up um, to be something that schools could almost get involved in. Um, and I've just been told that, fascinatingly for me, is that the first ROV um, was used in the same year as the first descent of Everest, um, that is 1953, for those of you not versed in, in Himalayan exploration uh, with Dmitry Rebikov. Um, so how big are ROVs? It's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, you can get um, one's the size um, of the ROV on my table here um, to something that would easily, you know, f fill this area. And it's really all the different sampling, um, the sampling tools that you need on it, the depth you want to go, um, and a range of other factors. So it's really getting the right ROV f um, for the job that you're looking to do. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's fascinating. So you can, I mean, you know, down to thousands and thousands of meters um, that, that, that you'll find these amazing different habitats deep in the ocean. And, th and that's where ROVs currently are being used a lot. Um, do you think we will get to a point where submersibles will be able to go below 200 meters, 250 meters? Certainly we are at that point already. Um, submersibles have been down to the deepest point um, in the ocean, in the Challenger Deep, um, in the Marianas Trench. Um, and that was Walsh and Picard. And then later, just a few years ago, uh, was James Cameron, the film director and producer. Um, so they have been down. Those were sort of like almost like record-breaking, um, you know, is it possible for us to get down here? The ability to do huge amounts of science wasn't that possible. There is also a, another um, expedition at the moment looking to do the five deeps, so to go to the deepest point in each of the ocean, ba ba each of the ocean basins um, around the world. So do look at the five deeps expedition online. And, you know, it's the deeper you go, the more complex the engineering in terms of getting the submersible down to um, withstand that kind of pressure. Just to give you a, a feel, at, uh, for every 10 meters, so at sea level we have uh, one bar or one atmosphere of pressure. For every 10 meters you go down, you get another atmosphere of pressure. So if you're at the bottom of the ocean, it's sort of 11,000 sort of meters down, sort of like 10, 10 and a half thousand uh, meters, we're getting to the, to the bottom of the uh, Marianas Trench. What you're seeing is that you've probably got sort of like 1100 atmospheres worth of pressure on top of you. And 
to give you a sense of what that is like, uh, if you can all Im just imagine uh, taking off uh, your shoe and sock and uh, just taking hold of the Eiffel Tower in one of your hands, turning it upside down and placing the point on your big toe, that's the kind of pressure um, that we're talking about. So it becomes a engineering issue. And I think for me, what is most amazing about this new generation of submersibles is this, uh, it's this pressure hull, this sort of bubble which the scientists are in, giving us them amazing 300, 360 view of the underwater world. Um, where do you think um, the next, next in mission or similar um, should explore? Um, amazing. Uh, so the next, I mean, I think this Nectar mission is, is fascinating because it is, it's, it's not just a one-off, it is a series of missions over the next um, two and a half years to explore the Indian Ocean. Now the Indian Ocean is our least explored ocean, it's the least um, known. And yet it has so many um, people living around its edges and so, so many people reliant on it. So you've got the whole of the east coast of Africa, um, you've got um, the Middle East, then you've got sort of the coasts of, of Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and then along the Southeast Asia. So the, there are n numerous people living along its coasts. And so it, it is both unexplored and incredibly important. And over the next two and a half years, the next mission will be creating this picture of um, the health and status of this ocean. Because they're going below that 30 meter mark where most scientific work has been done in the past decades. So they're going below scuba levels and really seeing these environments for the first time and connecting those surface environments down into the depths. And as you get deeper, I mean, we've got this idea that you know all the life is in the surface, is in the sort of sunlit area. It's you get the greatest abundance at the surface, so you get the greatest sort of amount of life. But as you go deeper, you get greater diversity. So the different number of species gets greater down into the depths and into the bathyal zone. Um, <laughs> uh, can ROVs um, be used to protect? endangered marine environments. And I think that, that's a really interesting idea about um, really sort of connecting research to protection. So ROVs and submersibles um, are used both to find out what's there, to collect data and samples, and also bring us back images so we can enjoy in the wonder of deep ocean exploration. So how then does that wonder and data transfer itself into protection? If you want good governance, and by governance I mean rules and enforcement and ideas about how we should work with the oceans, everything from regulating fisheries to regulating carbon dioxide or trash that gets into the oceans or these kinds of things, but rules and laws around that. You need to base that, those laws and that regulation on good data, on good facts. So the ROV plays a role there by delivering politicians, people in government who are making these laws, and it provides them with the information they need to make good laws to protect the ocean. So the ROV helps protect the ocean in that way. The ROV also helps in protecting the oceans because it shows us what's down there. It's very hard for us to really get energized about protecting the ocean if we don't know what's there. So it's fantastic that we're getting these amazing images. And I think we've got some images of a thrusher shark or, or, or sunfish, some of these incredible creatures that are found in the depths. And if it weren't for uh, this work, then we wouldn't be able to see those and we wouldn't realize what, we're, what we might lose. And I think one of the saddest things about changes in the oceans and why I really uh, admire the work of the Nectar mission is that it's so incredibly important to know what's there before we lose it and then we can work to protect it. 
Okay, this last question is a very good question. And I'm going to put it out to the Twitter sphere and to everybody else because I, I would like to know the answer to, to this too, um, which is why is the Indian Ocean the least explored? Uh, answers on a postcard to uh, Submarine Live, please, um, to the international science, marine science community. Why is the Indian Ocean the least explored ocean basin in the world? And that's, <laughs> I, I sort of swap between ocean and ocean basin, and I'll give you the technical reason for that. So, in fact, it's if you call each of the oceans a separate ocean, it ignores the fact that the um, ocean is, is one connected system. As people, we have decided to give different areas of the ocean different names, and that really represents sort of where they lie and, and how they're sandwiched between bits of land, um, and also the fact that they sort of do form these basins, these almost like, you know, sh hollow shapes. Um, going going down from the coast down to the depths and then and then back up again. So technically, um, we could say there's one ocean, one interconnected ocean, and then these separate Indian, um, Atlantic, Pacific, Arctic, Southern Ocean basins. I mean, I think really talking about um, the ocean literacy side of this, what one of the things that we're looking at is how we bring that. Um, to classes around the world and give you a sense of what it is like to explore the ocean. And we're coming to a close set very sadly on, on this ROV scientist um, live investigation, but we will be back, uh, I think, in two, two and a quarter hours, Jim, is that right? Two and a quarter hours with a submarine Q&A um, live from the expedition vessel and having one of the scientists, a coral ecologist um, we have um, this afternoon who will be speaking um, and answering your questions. Uh, if you've been enjoying Submarine Live, also don't forget that we have Arctic Live and that will be taking place from the UK's Arctic Research Station uh, on Svalbard from the 1st to the 8th of May and it will be wonderful to have you in the Arctic as well. Um, so thank you so much for being part of this ROV Scientist Live Investigation. Do join in for the rest of the week on Submarine Live. And it's a big, big thank you to the Necton First Descent Mission, to the AXA XL Oceans Education Program, and to Sonodyne for hosting us during Submarine Live. Big, big thank you and goodbye for now.